Amen. Uh, that's exactly what we're here, church family, to praise our Lord and our Creator. Amen. And uh, if you could please now turn to page 290, that'll be our uh, next and last song, page 290, and let's uh, all turn our eyes upon Jesus. Amen. Last verse, verse number three. so much. Gracious, loving, and heavenly Father, what an honor and a privilege it is to gather here in your house to worship you. I thank you, Lord, that you've permitted us to do so. And we ask, Father, as we are here, that your Holy Spirit will abide with us, to give us ears to listen to the message that you want to give. Father, give us the right spirit, I pray. Fill us with your love this worship hour, that everything we do will be to your glory and to your honor. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Thank you, choir, for that beautiful invocation. It's a lot better to be in the house of worship than last Sabbath I was watching online, and there's nothing more thrilling to be in the house of the Lord, and I'm just glad to be here today, even though I'm not quite my effervescent self, but God knows, and he's still on the throne. I just want to welcome you to church today and pray that you will receive an extended blessing as we sit at his feet. We have some announcements, but first of all, is does Pedro have to be here to vote? Oh, okay. We need to vote in our new member, Pedro C Carreran, the fourth. He was baptized a couple Sabbaths ago, so we'd like to Tell me how to do that. Please come up here, Pastor. <laughs> okay. I'm not thinking correctly. This morning, our uh, associate pastor is not feeling well, and so uh, you're excused. <laughs> and we're going to have special prayer for you here in a little bit. Okay. Um, the proper procedure is to ask the congregation if there's someone who would like to make a motion to receive Pedro Carrion the fourth into uh, membership. All right, it's been moved. Okay, is, there a is there a second? It is seconded. All right, go ahead and take the vote now. <laughs> okay, so now may we have your vote. All in favor, raise your right hand and say amen. amen. All right, so we'll let Pedro know that he's official. And we would like to remind you that our community wellness fair begins next Sabbath. Uh, we have done a lot of preparation for this, and just pay attention to the a timeline in the orange flyer, community wellness. We're going to be inviting the community also. Can I interject? Sure, please. The do. young adults will actually be passing out flyers this uh, afternoon after potluck to help spread this word. So if anyone would like to join, please do so. You're more than welcome. Amen. We'll have the special physicians with us. So pay attention. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity to learn some new things about being healthy and promoting health in the community and in your family. I could interject. Sure, let me interject on. <laughs> <clears throat> I hope you'll look at the green sheet. It is going to have basically everything I'm going to tell you right now, but I just want to make sure you know, <clears throat> and if you have the opportunity to spread the word, that this is a golden opportunity um, coming up next Sabbath, or next weekend, I should say, and the following weekend. The first weekend, we're going to have Dr. Tim Reisenberger here. He's an ER doctor, I believe, from the state of, he practices up in the state of Washington. He'll be here, and he'll begin presentations on Friday night, continue into my Sabbath school class the next morning, and then he'll have the, uh, the uh, sermon, and then an afternoon program. And from what I've heard from uh, Efren and others who have heard him, he's a, uh, he's a, dynamic, interesting uh, speaker. There's going to be a lot of good information that he will share. But then on top of that, in Pastor Lynch's office, he will be giving free consultations Sunday morning. Now, he has to leave about 3 o'clock. His plane leaves about 3 o'clock, so I don't know exactly how long he can stick around. So I'm going to leave it to him to make his own appointments with you. So if you would like to see a doctor and free of charge, you can do that by uh, making sure that you're here next weekend and talking to him about that beginning probably Friday night. Then the next, uh, the next thing that's uh, important that happens is that on that same, at that same time is the health fair that we just heard about. And um, lots of good things that are going to happen there. And um, then the next weekend, we're going to have a return of Dr. Mike Casey, who is a uh, naturopathic doctor. So he comes at it from a different, different uh, our health from a different angle, from the natural remedies angle. And he's a very interesting speaker, too. He also will be doing free consultations the following Sunday morning. So anyway, it's going to, the next two weekends are really big here in Chula Vista. This is our health emphasis month, and I pray that your health is blessed and, and improved. Uh, improved and that you feel better. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. Last announcement. There is a posting on the bulletin out in the foyer too, but next weekend is the Consumer Awareness Week with Nat Weeks. And they're just wanting you to be aware 
You know, 95% of the money Americans spend is on unhealthy, unprocessed food. So just an awareness about how we are as consumers, what we use our money for. And it'll be at Paradise Village on October the 11th. So look at the bulletin board and there's something posted about that. And so with no further announcements, we just pray that God will richly bless you as you sit in his presence and that you'll leave changed. God bless you. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, I believe verse 13. I'm sorry, 23. And it reads, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Please rise as we sing hymn 251, He Lives.
and let us all kneel as the choir brings us the prayer song. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity to, to come into your presence, to worship you. We seek to honor you, Father. And we also this morning want to remember those who are not with us, that are sick, that need our prayers. We want them to know that they are not forgotten, Lord. And so we pray that you would draw very near to each one who is not with us today because of illness or some other factor. We think this morning of, uh, of Robert, who has not been with us for several weeks. Lord, we, we miss his, his vibrant um, and uh, cheerful and um, knowledgeable ex uh, influence. We thank you for this, this, this man, Father. And we pray that you would soon restore him to complete health and to, uh, to our fellowship. Lord, please be with him. This morning, Dr. Green is with us, but uh, she has recently had other health issues confront her, and I want to lift her up, Father, and pray for your healing power to be at work in her life. Pastor Lynch is also with us, but she has uh, not been feeling well for a, a few days, some days, and we pray, Father, that your healing touch would be felt of her, too, and that she would soon be completely restored and uh, to complete health, Father. We love her and appreciate her ministry here, and so we pray for her for that reason, but we pray also for her for Jesus' sake, that her ministry on his behalf might continue um, with, uh, with power. We pray this morning for little Jamin, a uh, little boy that um, has speech problems, Father. I want to pray this morning that you would bless his parents and those who are trying to help him. For Danny and the crisis that she and her family have uh, come up against. And then, Lord, for, for Cindy and Rita, who are overseas just now in the Philippines. Somewhere over there, Father, they are ministering in your behalf, and we want to remember them. We pray, Father, that you would protect them. We pray, Father, that you would use them to win souls for your kingdom. We pray that the, the memory of um, Eldon and his uh, desire to serve and win souls for Christ would be honored through them. Amen. And we pray for ourselves this morning too, Father. We are here again in your presence, needing our Savior Jesus, needing, a, needing to hear from you, Father. And so speak to us today. Bless us today. Use us today. Bless the offerings that we bring. In every way, Father, make us your children, by your spirit in Jesus' name we pray, amen. It is now time for our lamb's offering, so if I could ask all the children to come forth and collect those dollar bills, fives and tens and twenties, whatever it may be. I'm asking for all the children to come forth. 
And then we also have a very special story given to us by Aida and myself. So please come forward. We want to make sure that all the children are up here because this is going to be special. Have all the children come up. Hello. Good morning, boys and girls. Have a seat quickly. Right here. All right. How are you guys this morning? Good? Well, I want to tell you a little story. Okay, so I was walking around the garden yesterday, and I picked up this rock. You guys see it? Yeah? Touch it. See that rough? It's dirty, right? Is that pretty? No. No. Is it pretty? No. No. Is it dirty? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is it rough? Yes. Yeah. Would you pay me money for it? Really? Oh, that's sad. Well. Well, this rock, children, it represents us. We are a little bit rough and a little bit dirty because we have sin. And, however, can you guys hear me? Okay, however, So, okay, he picked, and he said, I think there's some value in this, okay? Better, all right? And now, let me have the rock. Jesus, hold it. Jesus is polishing this rock like this. He's smoothing out all the rough edges. He's taking away all the dirt, and he's making it beautiful, and it's going to turn out like this. Is that pretty? Is it smooth? Is it beautiful? Yes. Would you pay for that? Yes, I would. Well, Jesus wants us to look like this. And he has given us our mommies and daddies to help us to get like this. When they tell you to do something or when they tell you to not do something, that is what they're doing. They're helping Jesus polish us so that we can get this beautiful. Now, we have a little gift for everybody. Okay? We have all of these beautiful, precious, polished stones. We're going to give them to you so that every time you guys look at this, you remember. What are you guys going to remember? That Jesus wants us to be like this. Polished, precious stones. Take one. Take one. Okay? Now, when you go back to your seat, give these to your mom and dad or, some, or an adult who's with you so you're not playing with it, okay? Oh, you want one? 
All right, once you've got your rock, go back to your seat, guys. Thank you. Our worship and giving this morning is for our local church budget. I'd like to direct your attention to the bulletin. You guys have seen this, I'm sure, each and every week for our graph. It shows where our progress is. And as you can see, we are behind. Not by much, but we're behind. And my question is, do you love this church? Amen. You know, the... Um, the early church gave up everything to propel this gospel message. And are we laying up treasures on earth or in heaven? And that's what we need to be asking ourselves. Giving, what we have is um, not even our own, our, our own. God has given to us so we can give back. In fact, the whole purpose of tithe and offerings is to teach us not to be selfish, right? So I'd like for you to remember that as we give our offerings this morning to help propel this message so we can get off this earth. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Our gracious Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the blessings that you give, how you provide for us. And Lord, you only ask for just a little bit back. I pray that what we give today, that you will take it and multiply it as Jesus did with the, with the loaves and fishes. Father, please... Bless our um, tithes and offerings that this work will be finished, that Jesus will come back soon. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Last Sabbath, we had a baptism. Amen. And uh, a few Sabbaths ago, Josephine was also baptized. Amen. And I told her that I was going to do the same thing that I did with, um, with, uh, Pedro. with Pedro, carry on. And that is that we'd uh, vote her into membership, and then, uh, which was done, subject to baptism. And then we would have a special prayer for her to receive the Holy Spirit. And I got back in the back, and I thought, oh no, I forgot to do that. And so anyway, we kind of did it in the water there, but you know, uh, we want to make sure. You, you know the disciples, the apostles, 
made sure the first 19 chapters have several instances of the of the apostles making sure that those who had been baptized of the water also were baptized of the Holy Spirit. Born of the water, but born of the Spirit. As Jesus said, unless you're born of the water and of the Spirit, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. And in Peter's um, sermon in chapter 2 of Acts, he, he preaches a long sermon there, and he says this in the 38th verse. Then Peter said to them, they asked, you know, they said, well, what do we do? The people that heard the sermon. And then Peter replies to their question. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Has anyone ever prayed over you that you would receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit? When you're baptized, did someone do that? <clears throat> Sometimes we just, you know, we baptize. This is my experience up until the mid 80s. We baptize and we just assume. We pray in the name of the Father. You know, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we assume that that takes care of it. Well, I don't know. I just became convicted that we shouldn't do that, that we should be like the apostles and make something special of that. And uh, so I'm going to ask Josephine to come up this morning and we're going to uh, turn my microphone on here back there at the PA booth, okay? And um, we're going to have a special prayer for her. We want to have the elders come up now too. And I'm just wondering, uh, Josephine, if someone else would like to come forward, would that be okay with you too? Okay. If, if you've never had someone pray for you that you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you're not sure whether you have received the Holy Spirit, I want to ask you to come up right now. Does anybody want to, to come up right now and say, you know, I want to make sure that I have this gift from the Lord. Please come up. Very good. Come on up. You've been baptized in the water, but you have never had anyone pray over you that you receive the Holy Spirit. You can come up right now. Anyone else? All right. Ladies, I'm going to ask you to come down here in the midst of the elders. Elders, please gather around these two ladies, Josephine and... Josephine and what was her name again? Lisa. Lisa. Lisa, thank you for coming forward. Ladies, I'd like to ask you to, to kneel down in the midst of the elders, okay? Just kneel down there. Elders, please. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Father in heaven this morning, we elders of the church lay our hands upon these who kneel before you, men and women. And each of them, Father, needs to have your Holy Spirit in a special way at work in their lives. We know that your Spirit is working on all human beings, that he calls, that he woos, that he urges uh, each of us to, to come to know you. But this morning, Father, we, we know that there's a special gift of the Holy Spirit that you want to give to Josephine yes. Amen. and to Lisa and to, uh, to Patty and to Ricky. And so, Father, please fall upon these, your believers. Amen. Come down and dwell in their hearts in a special way. Equip them, Father. We know this is one of the major roles of the Holy Spirit, to equip them to be your servants in this world with special gifts, abilities that they did not have prior to this prayer. Maybe it's boldness to, in service for you. Maybe it's the ability to speak before, uh, before people. 
Lord, whatever the gifts that you want to give, the gifts of hospitality, the gift of um, healing or, or prophecy, whatever you want to give, we know that it will be a blessing to your church, Father. And we claim these gifts now because you offer them. You said you're more willing to give than, than we are these gifts than we are to give our children good gifts. And so thank you, Father, that you do this for Jesus' sake and for the sake of your church. Amen. Amen. Our worship and music this morning is being brought to us by the choir. We'll be singing the song, Lead Me to Calvary. Amen. Are you going to sing with them? Please open your hymnals to 317, Lead Me to Calvary. Our prayer this morning is, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. The inspired the inspired pen says, whenever possible, let's involve the whole congregation to the special music. So today, we will have a special music with the whole congregation. If you please would like to stand up, and we will sing stanza one and four. So uh, one and four. OK. I like being up here when the choir is singing and singing along with them because I miss being out there with you singing amongst the congregation and hearing your voices. So I feel like I'm actually in the congregation uh, more that way. So I sure do appreciate our choir. How about you? Amen. And uh, you know, they, they're looking for more people to join the choir. So um, please uh, keep that in mind. If you like singing, especially if you have a, a real talent for singing, please consider joining our choir. Well, welcome. It's nice to be with you this morning. Um, I want to begin our message this morning, of course, with prayer. And so I'm going to ask you to please bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, we know that nothing good is going to happen here in the next few minutes. Nothing's going to be heard that's of any worth 
unless your spirit, unless your spirit, Father, is with us here, teaching us, opening up our minds and hearts to what your message is for us, my words, my thoughts are nothing, and they will not bless, and I know that, Lord. I need your help. So I'm asking for your Holy Spirit this morning. I'm asking for wisdom from on high. And it is for Jesus' sake, Father. It is for your people's sake that I pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Years ago, maybe many years ago, high schools and colleges would produce a yearbook. Now, I know that PUC, because I've talked to my daughter Sarah recently about this, does produce a yearbook, but it's nothing like what it was back in the 1930s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s when I was in college. And, and um, it's, it's not the same thing anymore. The emphasis is not there. But anyway, back in those days, do you remember some of you who are um, more experienced like I am? <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the, the yearbook that you got when you were in high school? And you passed, I have to admit, I never bought a yearbook from high school. If I got one, I don't, I don't, I certainly don't have it anymore. And I'm sure I didn't actually buy one, so just call me cheap. But um, anyway, but I, you know, I, I saw others, you know, and you know what they'd do is they'd pass those around to all their friends. And, and, you, and what would the friends do? They would write little notes in it, you know. And sometimes, sometimes if you go through the yearbook, there would be someone who'd circle a picture. Maybe they'd circle a picture of themselves because they didn't want you to forget them. They wanted you to remember them. And it, it may be that someone who loved you circled that picture in the hopes that you would never forget them because they loved you. God has a yearbook too. It covers all the years, all the years of your life. The yearbook of this world is the Bible. And God has drawn circles in this book, so to speak, hoping that we would not forget his love and the first circle that God draws, I want to draw your attention to, is found in John 3, 16 and 17. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The first circle that God draws is big enough to encompass the entire world. God loves the world, and he circles the world in his yearbook. What is, when we say he loves the world, what does that mean? Does he love everything about this world? Even the worldly things? No, of course he doesn't. What does it mean when it says he loves the world? Well, first of all, does he love the planet? Does he love this planet? Of course he does. He says, after he creates it, he says it's very good. And even though we have brought sin into this world, he still loves it. He sees the sparrow that falls. He loves that sparrow that fell today. He loves all the animals. He loves everything, every living thing. He loves the trees. He loves this planet, brothers and sisters. He loves it. He wants us to take care of it, by the way. He loves the birds and the fish and the animals. How about the people? Which ones out of the people does he love? He loves them all, yes. So much so that he finds a way to delay that work of judgment. It's notice he, he ties it together with, with his love together with judgment. He says, he sent him not into the world to 
condemn. To actually, the word is krino, krisis. There's a, a Greek word, you know, two Greek words that are, that are basically the same, uh, krisis and krino, and they, they are that word condemn, con translated condemn in this verse. He sent his son not into the world to condemn the world. The word is based upon the idea of making a decision to distinguish, to make a distinction. Jesus did not come the first time. God loved the world so much. He sent his son into the world, but not to make a decision to distinguish between the saved and the lost yet. That work he, he delayed for thousands of years. First through his promise that there would come a savior, and then after the savior had come, still he delays that work for another 1,800 years or so to, until 1844. You know, you read a few chapters later in John, after John 3, you go to John 12, verse 31. 12, 31. John 12, verse 31. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. We're going to go to Isaiah 53 after that, just to give you a little heads up, and then Proverbs. So John 12, 31, then Isaiah 53, and then Proverbs. Okay? John 12, 31. Now, Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And you say, well, he sent his, said he'd sent him not into the world to condemn, to judge, but now he says, now is the judgment. Right in the middle of his ministry, or excuse me, to the end of his ministry, he says this. What's he talking about? Well, of course, he's talking about how that the judgment, the condemnation fell upon him. Amen? On Golgotha's cross, Jesus experienced the judgment of this world. Our judgment is a three-phase judgment. As I said, it comes, begins in 1844, and it's a three-phase judgment. First for the dead, then the living, and then later during the thousand years, the judgment of humanity continues with the judgment of the lost or the wicked. But first, in his love, for the world, Jesus took our sins upon himself. Now, last Sabbath I mentioned this during the communion service, but this Sabbath I'd like to show you why I said that in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, beginning with verse 4. Are you there? How many are there? All right, I don't hear any pages turning. Do I? Oh yeah, there I hear a few. Okay, Isaiah 53, beginning with verse 4. Let's look at this together. Note this carefully. Look at this carefully this morning. Very interesting. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. What is that? He carries our, he's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God. Okay. Did God the Father do this to his son? and afflicted, all right? But now, who is this talking about? Who is it that's stricken, smitten, uh, borne our griefs? Who is this? It's Jesus, yes, it's talking about Jesus. But he, Jesus, verse five, but he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He, Jesus, was bruised for our iniquities, the chastity, Chastisement of our peace was upon him, upon Jesus, and with his, that is Jesus, stripes, we are healed. Amen? Amen? Now watch this carefully. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord, who is that? Who is that? Jehovah. Who is Jehovah? Because that's who that's talking about. Who is Jehovah? Yahweh. Jesus. Jehovah is Jesus. Didn't you know that? Yahweh. I am. It's when Jesus says in the New Testament, I am. Tell them I, you know, he says I am. And, and when Moses 
uh, is talking to God. He says, tell him that I am. That was Jesus that was talking to Moses. It was Jesus who says I am before Abraham was I am. Jehovah, this is Jehovah, the great I am. And so the Lord, Yahweh, the second person of the Godhead. Now, read it, read it again. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. And Jehovah, okay, the second person of the Godhead hath laid on him. Now, who's that talking about? Upon Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And so here's the picture. Somehow, the second person of the Godhead, Jehovah, laid upon Jesus, just pretend for a second, I, I hate to do this, so anyway, somehow he, Jehovah laid on the human being Jesus the iniquity of us all. So essentially what's going on there is that he laid it upon himself. Does that make sense? Do you see that? Do you follow that? How many are with me? How many are confused? Come on, don't, don't be shy. Raise your hand. Are you confused? Do you want me to go through that again? You didn't get it. All right. You're not admitting it that you didn't get it. I see the blank looks on your faces. <laughs> Jesus is Jehovah? Or let's put it this way, Christ. Might be helpful to use these three different names, rather titles. Christ, this Messiah, is both Je Yahweh, Jehovah, and a, and a human being by the name of Jesus. Brought into one person. And this says that that one person who had divinity and humanity, that the, the, the divine aspect and powers of the Christ, were used by Christ to lay upon the human being, Jesus, all the iniquity and sins of you and I. Now do you get it? So God definitely drew a circle around the world, a circle of love. He died for all the world. He did this for every human being who ever lived, for all the sins, everything that ever happened here in this earth. He took all the guilt for everything that happened, even though he was innocent. God loves the world. Christ loves, the Father loves the world. Christ loves the world. Do I love the world? Proverbs 24, 11 says this, rescue those being led away to death. R Proverbs 24, 11. <clears throat> this is the NIV version. I just kind of like the way this version puts it. Proverbs 24, verse 11. Speaking to us, it says, rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Now don't miss this. Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? Waddles was a duck, a little baby duck given to Susie when she was just two years old. And that duck grew and grew, and it would, they were inseparable. Everywhere Susie went, the duck followed her around, you know. Mama, you know how the little ducks followed mommy, you know. And that little duck would follow her around, and it grew and grew. And um, they were just inseparable. But then two years later, a little sister was born. Let's call her little Mary. Or no, better yet, let's call her Mercedes. Mercedes was, was born. And, um, and all of a sudden, 
that little duck named Waddle, a boy duck, by the way, he all of a sudden realized that he had a new responsibility. And so whenever mommy would, would uh, take Mercedes into the backyard and, you know, put her in her little bassinet there to kind of get some sun and fresh air, Waddles was right there underneath the bassinet ready to guard Mercedes. Sometimes Susie left the, she was four years old now, sometimes she could open the gate and, you know, the gate got left open every once in a while. But nobody came through that gate. There wasn't, a, a, you know, a, met with waddles, screeched and quacks and wings flapping and, you know, protecting her little one, her little Mercedes. <laughs> one day the phone rang and a neighbor said, in her, you know, uh, very concerned tones, I just saw a dog go up your driveway and towards your backyard fence. And it, and it was foaming at the mouth. Now, children, are you listening to me, kids? Listen to me. You know, when dogs get rabies, they, they, um, they die from it eventually, but they go crazy. And they, they'll, a, a dog that, you know, loves you and so forth will all of a sudden turn on you and attack you. And if it bites you, by the way, you have to have some terrible shots. It's a, a terrible cure you have to go through. But in any case, um, I think it's lots of shots. But don't they give them right in the tummy too? Anyway, you don't want to go through it. And uh, that dog looked like it had rabies. And so uh, it, was one, it wandered right into the yard and you know what Waddles did. Waddles, all of a sudden, there was a screech and quacking and flapping of wings and mama you know, heard this just as she put the phone down from the neighbor's call and she, of course, was already rushing to the backyard to, to, to get Mercedes. And she rushed out there and Waddles and this dog were fighting with each other and there was all kinds of growls and noises. It was just a terrible, uh, terrible fight going on. But Mommy was able to take up little Mercedes in her arms, carry her into the house to safety. And there she sat listening as this battle went. She didn't dare go out there. The dog might bite her and she'd get rabies. And so the battle went on until there was silence. And she went, that duck was so protective. It says here in this passage, does not he who guards your life. God, God is a protective God. I'm a protective father. I sometimes I've been accused of being overprotective. Um, I s identify with this so much. God wants to wants us to be engaged in protecting others. Well, she when she went out in the backyard, there was the the dog, dead. It died out there, and Waddles was dead too, though. God is a protective father and he expects us to join him in fighting off the enemy of helpless souls. Do I love the world? If I love the world, I am in, in going to join him in that battle in rescuing the lost. Amen? Amen. And so are you. Now the next circle that God draws, Ephesians 5.25, Ephesians you'll probably recognize this is that famous chapter that talks about husbands and wives. Husbands, love your wives, Paul says, as, Ephesians 5.25, as Christ also loved who? The church. the church and gave himself for it. God draws a circle around the church. Now this love that he has for the church is different. It's not the same as for the world. There's a special sort of love that God has for his church. And it's related to what we just read in Proverbs 24. It's related to the first circle that he draws around the world. 
God has a special regard for his church because it is the agency through which Christ's evangelistic ministry continues in this earth. It is his agency to give the message to the world that God loves the world. And so he has a special regard for his church. It is of, you might say it's almost in the earth of, of, of us human beings, it is of even higher regard. Well, I, I'm going to get ahead of myself if I say too much more about that. God loves the church. Do I? James 3, 6. I need to hurry, hurry on here. James 3. Try to catch up with me. James 3. We're going to spend some time there, and then Ezekiel will come next. James and then Ezekiel. <clears throat> James 3, 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith, bless we God, even the Father. Therewith, curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? It doesn't happen, and it shouldn't happen in the church. One bitter curse upon the church is gossiping and false witness. I have another story for you. There was a, a German scientist, children, a German scientist, young people. So I don't have the attention of some of our little kids. You know, they're like me when I was young. I didn't listen to the sermon at all <laughs> until I was a 10 or 12 years old. Then I started listening to the sermons. Anyway, kids, there was a German scientist, and he had gotten hold of a seed, and this seed came from a, from a mummy in Egypt, and that seed was estimated or believed to be about 4,000 years old. Well, it's at least a few thousand years old, okay? But it has to me to be 4,000 years old. And he thought, I wonder if this seed will sprout. You know, seeds die after a while. They, they lose that life, that spark of life. And so he planted this seed, and uh, he waited, and he waited, and he hoped, and he waited, and he hoped, and his, he had two little sons, and they saw the disappointment on Daddy's face as he'd go look and no seed. You know, and of course, he, Daddy talked about what, what he was doing. And the little boys got an idea. What do you think they did? Well, they went and found a, a, a wheat seed, and they planted that seed in the, in the place where Daddy had placed the 4,000-year-old seed. They felt sorry for Daddy. They wanted to help Daddy out. They wanted to make him feel better. And so they planted that seed there, and sure enough, the seed sprouted, and the father was amazed. He says, wow, a 4,000-year-old seed has, has, has sprouted. And of course, being a scientist, you know, he had access to scientific journals, and he wrote another, you know, it's, it's what does they say, published, or what is that phrase for teaching publishers? Published. Publish or perish, you know. Well, he got his article all written out. A 4,000-year-old seed sprouts, you know, and he announces it to the world. Well, his boys didn't realize what was going to happen, and so they, um, but they knew they had to confess to Daddy. They didn't want to deceive him or for the world either. So they went to Daddy, and they, they told him what they did. And, oh, no. And so he quickly sat down and wrote another article trying to undo what he'd done. But did it undo what he'd done? Nope, it didn't. Because there's a lot of people that read that first article that did not see the second article. And so the word spread you know, amongst the in newspapers and people, you know, non-scientific community. Lots of people went on you know, telling the story about the 4,000-year-old seed that sprouted. I think I even heard this story way, way back years ago. It's a true story. 
And so I want to tell you something about gossip and false witness. Unlike us human beings, unlike us, they have a life after death experience, in other words, and it's instantaneous. Um, there's a, there's a, the spirit of the gossip goes on and on and on. In fact, it even, in this case, it even grew. And, and so it is with, with uh, gossip. You know, we can tell whether we love the church or not by whether we engage in this dangerous practice of telling stories, bad things about people in the church or church leaders or whatever. Don't do it. I can't help it. We had some meetings here one night, and uh, they were, it was about the contemplative prayer. And some guy sitting right over there where you, about where Ben is, congratulations, Ben. Anyway, uh, they, uh, <laughs> you moved away. <laughs> anyway, sitting about where Ben is now, and Ben, please, I'm sorry to say this with you sitting there, but he was sitting about where you're sitting anyway, and he be proceeded to tell the, the, the audience that um, one of our great evangelists had gotten into this contemplative prayer and that he was promoting it. And I said, wait, just a hold, just, just a second. You know, I knew he didn't know for that for sure. And by the way, this person wrote an article that came out in the Review and Herald some months later that proved that he, he wasn't into this. It was Mark Finley, by the way. Mark Finley isn't into that stuff. It was, a, it was a misunderstanding. Anyway, we got to be careful about the things we say about one another. Amen? Amen. Let's guard one another and, our, and each other's reputation, the reputation of the church. If you love the church, you won't do that. Well, I'm going to tell you another story. I'm gonna, we're going to skip Ezekiel except to say that, you know, I learned something from Ezekiel. I thought that sheep were docile, gentle, kind-hearted creatures. But when you read Ezekiel 34, 15 to 22, you'll see a different picture. And let me, let me tell you what it is. You, did you know this? That, that sheep have what they call a budding order. There's a horning order with critters that have, animals that have horns. And there's, you know, with horses, they... You know, there's a dominant horse and so forth and so on. What they call the alpha uh, amongst the dogs and so forth. But there's a similar thing, only it's the ladies. Gentlemen, it's the ladies. <laughs> and uh, it's the ewes. There's a, a dominant ewe. That, and how she keeps her place is she just, you know, she'll just butt the younger and the weaker and the smaller and so forth if they're, if they're approaching that special place of, of grass or, you know, where she was, or water or whatever it is, or a place, special place that she likes to sleep. If anybody gets near that, you know, she'll just run right into them and drive them away. But you know what changes everything? As soon as the shepherd appears, all that competition, all that striving disappears. We need the shepherd. If the shepherd is in this church, and by the way, this is a nice church, but this tells us what the devil, I just want to, this is what the devil wants to bring in. Gossiping, you know, striving for position, pride. These are the kind of things that ruin a church. Don't let it happen, amen? amen. Let, me, let me hear it from everybody. Amen. Please, give me your commitment. You're not going to engage in this. All right, here we go. Do you commit to that? Amen. That's not good enough. I know there's somebody that didn't say it. <laughs> Let's try it again. Everybody. Amen. Oh, thank you. I hope that's from your heart. All right. So God draws another circle. We have two more circles to go. I will try to make these fast. Okay. God draws another circle. John 17, verse 23 and 24. I in them and thou, this is our scripture lesson, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Aha. 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, 
that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. The Father's love for the world and for the church is different than this. This is a special love. This is a circle around the face of Jesus. If you want a picture of that love, look at the life of Jacob. Remember Jacob? Who was later called Israel? He had a, a son. What was that son? Who, who do you think I'm thinking of? Yes. The love that God the Father has for Jesus is like that of Jacob's love for Joseph. Above, above all his other sons and daughters, Jacob loved Joseph. Above all others, he loved Joseph. And there we see a picture of God's love for his son. There's a specialness of God's love that borders on, but I don't think we can really say, but borders on favoritism. It's a unique love for a unique son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, his monogenes, his only unique son, his only begotten son. This is his only son. He loved, yes, his only begotten son, the only son that God has ever had in this earth in the way that he had Jesus. It's, it's, it's a unique love. And then God draws another circle. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ gave himself he took up my infirmities. He bore my iniquities, my sin. He made himself my guilt offering. He poured out his life unto death for me. It was his will to crush himself in Jesus and cause him to suffer for me. And what did he experience? What did he take upon himself? Number one, he took my guilt. He took my guilt. That feeling of guilt, he experienced it for me. Number two, he took my condemnation. The judgment against sin, uh, my sin, was upon him. He took that upon himself. And number three, he took my infirmities. What is, when it says he took our infirmities, what is that telling us? That's telling us that he takes the diseases, he takes the consequences of sin. See, disease is a consequence of sin. Infirmity is a consequence of sin. And so Jesus not only takes the guilt and the condemnation, okay, but he takes all the consequences. I don't know how he did that, but he experienced, you have health problems? You have, have you suffered? Somehow or other, Jesus took all of that upon himself. He took the consequences, too. That's what the text says. You think, well, I take the consequences for my sin. Well, I'm just telling you what the Bible says, right? Essentially, that's what he did. In Christ, Jehovah captured, arrested, convicted, condemned, and executed the human being known as Jesus for crap, capital crimes we committed. And you, of course, know that any departure from God's will is a capital crime in God's kingdom, right? One little piece of fruit was a capital crime. He did this all so that God could give us time to return to our loyalty to God. He did all this so that we would not have to immediately die for our sins. Think about that. By his law, the very first time that you sinned, you should have died. No matter what it was. No matter how seemingly inconsequential or small your little sin was, you should have died right then. You, you should have paid the penalty for your sin right then. And Jesus died on that cross and took all the consequences of our sins, the guilt, 
the condemnation, the suffering. He took it all so that God, he could buy you time to return to your loyalty to God. Say thank you, Jesus. I didn't hear it. You ought to thank Jesus. He did all that for you to buy you time. If you, don't, if, you, if you feel like you're not there yet, if you think you're not quite right with God this morning, you have time. And Jesus paid the, the, the ticket for, for you to have that time. He paid so, so that you could have that time this morning. Thank God that you have a time of grace and mercy. This self-condemnation, taking it all, all the punishment. Oh, by the way, if sin is supposed to be punished right away, I mean, if, if, if he hadn't bought us time, then Adam would have died and we never would have been born. It would have just all ended, boom, right then. So thank God he gave not only, he gave all of us, this time. Okay, well anyway, self-condemnation for sins that he took for us. Things he did not commit was another act, dear brothers and sisters, an act of creation. He didn't, you know, you, I said he bought us time. He actually created time for us. A time of mercy, grace, and deliverance. So now, let's review. God loves the world. And it's no wonder. He's the creator. He's the father, I should say, of its creation. He loves the church. He's its creator, too. It's father, too. Because he loves the church because through the church, his message of love for the world is made known. And he loves his son. And he, he always has loved his son. But now still more because, he, believe it or not, Still more he loves his son because his son creates mercy and salvation for the world. God loves you because he's your creator. His son loves you and so he loves you. And you love and honor his son and so he loves you. And you have gratefully received, can you say amen to this? Have you gratefully received his mercy and salvation and been born again? Amen. Then you're the offspring of Christ. You're the bride of Christ. When my daughters get married, do you think I love my son-in-law? Do you think I love my grandchildren? Of course. That's the way it is with God and Jesus. Jesus has married himself to humanity. And of course the Father loves the one Jesus has married. Jesus has caused us to be born again. We are born into his family. Is God going to love the offspring? Is the Father going to love the offspring of his son Jesus? Amen. Of course he is. And that's you. And so this morning, 